uh, couldn't make it tonight can listen in. We'll hit pause uh, by request of uh, presenter at uh, a certain point during the, the night. Uh, otherwise, things will be posted online uh, to uh, the, the Slack and uh, email list uh, later here as things become available. We'll give Eddie, looks like Eddie's connected in here now, uh, if he can hear us. Yep, I can hear you guys. Wow, you're uh, in a lot nicer place than uh, most of us usually are at. Uh, uh, that's Capitol the building. <laughs> it's still a little nicer than the, the digs uh, I, I'm at here. Uh, anyway, welcome. Uh, let's yeah. see here. So uh, I'm going to hit mute here on you, Alex, since it seems like we're or not sure who we were getting the, the blowback from here. It might, it might have been uh, Eddie, but uh, we're, we're all good here now. So welcome. This is the Linux users group. And uh, as you can tell, we meet the third Wednesday of every month. Uh, currently, we're online. Uh, that's one of the things uh, I, I guess it's worth talking about at some point here, uh, whether or not we go back to in-person or not. Uh, I, I know we're, we're definitely not to that point where it's probably safe to do yet, but at some point, things have to get better, I, I, I hope. Uh, but other connectors that you can connect up with us is uh, our website at cialug.org. Uh, we have an email listserv that you can sign up for at there, as well as a Slack and IRC uh, channel. And now the, the magic there is that uh, there's a bridge in between them. So if you say something in Slack, the, the uh, old gray beards that are in IRC can hear and uh, vice versa for uh, us new kids over in uh, Slack can see what the IRC people say. So, uh, this is the point where I plead, beg, and cajole if anyone's willing to talk about uh, anything that's Linux related or Linux adjacent or even free and open source software. Uh, uh, Ken, Ken is uh, saying that uh, his beard is salt and pepper, not, not gray. So uh, that's fair. Uh, but if you have something that you want to talk about that uh, you want to present to a fairly friendly room that isn't a room, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to uh, give a talk about anything that's uh, at least somewhat interesting and somewhat uh, free and open source uh, related. And we, we can stretch pretty far to, to make that fit. Uh, so we, we've hit the, the point in the, the night where we talk about uh, uh, the uh, world of uh, Linux news and what's going on in the world. Very new parser frameworks to come up with formal parsers instead of just trying to get, write your own parser by hand, which, which always leads to bugs. Um, one downside is that right now the Rust standard library being linked in uh, makes those binaries kind of huge. And so some of those probably need to get rid of the, the Rust standard library as they're building them. Uh, and also Rust standard library hasn't been very good so far at exploiting advice to the operating system. Like, hey, I'm gonna go make a, sequ a sequential read like you would for a word count program and so the operating system doesn't have advice on, on how to do things behind the scenes for your systems calls. Uh, right now, the, the Rust MIT infrastructure is uh, very immature for testing. Uh, right now, I would recommend essentially building it and then running it under the GNU test suite and just seeing what bugs come up. Um, of, course, of course, you're not going to have full feature parity, but it's going to catch a lot of the, the same bugs just doing those integration tests. Um, and uh, right now, if, if you want to learn how to use Rust, uh, helping out with the, the port to the core utils would be great. Um, you're really going to learn system calls better than probably about 90% of the professional Rust developers out there, because not many of them deal with uh, systems calls as low level as when you're working with these uh, Unix tools. Uh, and then just a, just a roadmap for, for where we need to go in the future, as I'm seeing the, the, the current state. 
is uh, if you look at the GNU tools, they have a lot of file system paranoia on reads and writes. And we really need to flesh out uh, how much of what they're doing is snake oil and, and what are the, uh, how much of that paranoia is very real and needs to be adopted by the other projects. Um, also, right now, all three projects have very poor sharing of, of their test suites and almost no benchmarks. Uh, there's almost no formal specification in terms of like using something like Alloy or Lins Leslie Lamport's TLA Plus to really get it. Uh, some of the complexity that we put in those tools that we kind of kid ourselves that we, we know the full state space of those programs, we really need to have provable specifications before we start coding things. Uh, we, we need to be really mindful of uh, branch pre pre predictions. Uh, and where we can't get rid of those branches, we probably need to recompile with profile gu guided optimization to see if we can get some help there. Uh, we need to do a lot more shell testing. And I linked there uh, on a good uh, article on how Auk has tested its stuff uh, at the shell level instead of trying to do all these language specific tests, which don't work very well. Um, and also j just in terms of the, the grammars that you put into the, the command line, we need to formalize those instead of just writing handwritten parsers. Um, we need to make more structured use of operating system advice for like, hey, we're gonna be using a, a sequential file read or whatnot. Um, there has to be more support on across all three implementations for uh, supporting SIMDs that certain chips have and uh, multi-core for, for, for users that wanna compile it for multi-core use. Um, right now, there's not very, good test suite for doing operating system call expectations with either eBPF or Linux or S-Trace or D-Trace. Um, so anyone who wants to write a library that would help with that, that'd be great. Uh, Google Test has said that they're going to reject any pull requests that add that, that type of functionality to Google Test because they want to make it operating system agnostic. Um, as I've been going through doing this, uh, a lot of my benchmarking, I've been using user bin time which is different than the, the time command that you have inside bash. And uh, both Linux and Apple have a, a command flag in there that dumps all of the uh, operating system information as you're running the utility, not just the runtime. Uh, and so that, that's a really quick and dirty way to um, get at a lot of the performance things at, at the shell level in one line. And what would be really nice is if somebody wrote a criterion style uh, wrapper on top of that so you could do say 20 executions and then have some nice statistical information as to what how the distribution's falling and right now we really don't have a tool for that at the shell level a lot of these uh, criterion type projects are very much in a certain language like like haskell or rust um, and also as you're testing these make sure you test with different shells uh, I, i've seen a lot of bugs uh, that you'll you find in one shell that you won't find in another and I think some of these are actually uh, bugs in Bash, where it just uh, it hoses your terminal and you have to reset it. Uh, and also, as as we write these tools, we need to be very mindful. As I, I was using curl yesterday to do a bunch of stuff, and I had to execute it once for every URI. And it would be really nice as we're writing these to make sure that we're able to write, run them in batch mode, and so you don't have to. Uh, call reload that shell utility for every single input so it can take like a an input list output list um and not have that exact overhead and then the bottom is just my raw notes i haven't quite got into a blog post yet if, if there's any questions so you mentioned uh, uh if you want to help right. how would one uh, get into uh volunteering to help with this sort of work yeah if you scroll to the top Just go to any of those repositories. Um, either so the, the unit, sorry, either the Rust MIT repo is the one that I, I've been working on. Um, it's on GitHub. Anybody can contribute to it. Um, GNU has a lot. Uh, th their their process is a lot more involved. And I also I, I've never even looked into the BSD uh, uh, how how they have process. And, and Apple usually feeds from BSD. They usually don't take pull requests directly. And I've never really used Illuminos, which is the new uh, open source Solaris. I, I'm assuming it's closer to BSD, but I, I haven't looked at it too much.
Anyone with any other questions for Chad? Okay, hearing none, uh, uh, that, that's fine. Uh, we'll thank you, Chad, for your uh, enlightening talk there. Uh, can you hear me now? I, yes, we can hear you now, Dan. But not now, if he's trying to talk. Yeah, uh, we, we heard you ask if we could hear you now, and then there was nothing there. I was going to ask Chad to fix his real-world Rust performance, just to put to R. Okay. Uh, no, uh, it, it reconnected. It was a Zoom uh, burp. Sorry about that. You can type if you have a question, Dan. Yeah, uh, let, let's just go ahead with that, uh, Dan. If you have a question, we're we're having trouble hearing you. Um, and uh, we'll we'll handle that that question there offline uh, while while we keep plowing ahead here. I I guess. Uh, Sorry about that. It bounced back and forth a few times, but I'll 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 just I'll just, I'll just type it over. I'll send it to you on uh, on on the Hangouts. Uh, I'll send okay. it to you on Hangouts. Okay. Uh, um, while well, while we're waiting for that here, we'll we'll circle back and uh, get, get his question here in a, a bit. Uh, uh, the the main presentation of the the night was going to be about uh, reverse proxies and uh, first by a little bit of introduction. Hopefully, people can see my my slides since last time uh, I presented for about ten minutes without actually anyone seeing anything. Confirming that people can see things. Oh, you're wanting confirm confirmation? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you're, for a year, you've been a relative shut-in. Sad face. Yes. 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 Uh, so uh, uh, I, I'm going to post the slides as well as a link to my uh, source files uh, that that I how I basically made the sausage here uh, uh, to both the email list and to the IRC channel and uh, also to my own personal dumping ground of uh, data. Uh, and basically by, by day I work as a senior scientific software developer slash staff specialist now, I guess. I'm still trying to figure out what exactly they call me now. But they, that's changed slightly from the, the last month's presentation. And by night, I like to play with Linux. Um, and uh, if you need me, I'll still be here in the same same spot, uh, at least until July. We, we've been uh, now almost a, a year uh, working from home. And uh, yeah, it's it's been quite a ride and we can stop and get off any time now, I, I'd really like. Uh, but so wh what am I actually going to be talking about tonight? Uh, enough about the, the uh, uh, sad state of uh, not getting out and going places. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about a reverse proxy. Why do you need it? Let's go through a couple different options that, that I played with. Uh, Caddy 2 is a fairly uh, easy, light-ish light uh, newcomer to the game. And then uh, the venerable old uh, Nginx, which uh, is a very powerful, very uh, customizable and very flexible, but it's also just hard as heck to try and configure. And then we'll walk through a couple uh, lab uh, slash demo sort of things, setting up some um, things to proxy and then uh, see what we can break. And then uh, earlier, uh, uh, I think it was yesterday, Chad had mentioned this uh, Sozu uh, proxy. I didn't have a chance to actually make it work, but we can see if we can't uh, uh, try and modify things on the fly and make things actually uh, play with it because I mean the the demo gods aren't uh, nearly mad enough uh, at me. Uh, I see there's a 
message in chat, but I'm not actually able to open it here while I'm screen sharing, it looks like. I have no idea what's happening here. Uh, so if someone else can see and read the, that there's, chat there's message. A comment. It's not a question. Keep going. Okay. I'll, I'm, I'm going to plow ahead then. Uh, and so let, let's first talk about uh, Caddy. Uh, le, the, the goods, the bads, the ugly. So uh, the, the pro is it's written in Go. I, that might be a con too, depending on what your feelings about Go is. It's a fairly new kit on the block. It was released back in 2015. And one of the things that I really like the most about it is that it has native support of uh, uh, TLS and uh, HTTP2 just fresh out of the box. And if you're a fan of Let's Encrypt, all you have to do is just basically say which uh, website you or what URL you want it to, to host. And it handles your ACME uh, Let's Encrypt uh, reservations automatically. And it by far is the easiest and most friendly way of handling it. Uh, one minor gotcha if you're doing it in Docker, uh, you want to make sure that the spot where it drops the, the ACME certificate uh, or your, your Let's Encrypt certificates, you want to make sure that that's dropped into a persistent volume because if you don't and you're rapidly cycling through, you, you've got a couple times and then Let's Encrypt will uh, put you in jail for a while because uh, they, they get kind of cranky if you keep asking for the same thing over and over again. Uh, and it's also really stupid easy to configure with a, not even really a YAML, just a text file uh, that they call caddy file. And their documentation is by far the, the most friendliest, easiest to use stuff. You can see a screenshot there of where they walk you through, I, I want to set it up as a static file server. I want to do a reverse proxy. I want to have a redirect, et cetera. Their, their documentation is just so friendly to a, a noob like me. So it, I, I'm actually using this in production for a personally hosted um, set of websites. Um, and it, it just was the easiest thing to set up. So of course the cons, it, it's a relatively new kit on the block. Uh, especially in the, this version two of stuff, some of their config files are, uh, they, they have warnings that they're uh, experimental and that they could still uh, change and uh, change their mind. Uh, it is more of an HTTP uh, only uh, proxy. You can't do goofy things like a TCP load balancing and uh, amazing stuff like that. Uh, and it, it is not as performant as Nginx but you know, grand scheme of things, hosting your blog, unless you get uh, slash dotted, you're, you're probably gonna be okay. And so uh, their, their documentation and what they can do for reverse proxying. Uh, let's just go ahead and dive into their document, their uh, uh, how-to files, because it's really, the, it's so approachable that it's just easy. So, uh, the, this is the, the URL I had there, uh, walking you through the, the configs for reverse proxy. Uh, so you can modify what the, the load balance uh, policy is. Uh, you can do active health checking to ping and see, hey, service that you're reverse proxying, is that actually uh, healthy and working? Uh, how long things should fail when they fail? Basically all sorts of flexibility here. And uh, it also can handle uh, various different things like uh, uh, running console to figure out uh, where your uh, service is and various schemas like that. Uh, for the load balancing, you've got your usual selection of like round robin where it iterates through each uh, possible um, spot in turn. It chooses the first one. It uh, chooses the, the one with the least number of connections. It just randomly chooses. Uh, so, I mean, you, you've got a lot of flexibility there, or you can also, based on a cookie, make it sticky so that uh, once you hit uh, the, the load balancer and uh, you're, you're stuck on one of your uh, items that you're uh, reverse proxying, you, you just stay there depending on what your service is. Uh, it really makes sense. 
your health check, basically it can hit uh, a URL and say, hey, are you still there? And if it doesn't respond, then you know that there's a problem and it pulls itself out of the, the pool. And uh, otherwise, uh, streaming really makes sense for, uh, depending on how you're doing compression and uh, to fill up a packet before you send it out the door. Uh, And uh, the other big one that I, I found out that I needed to uh, deal with was the uh, HTTP transport. And uh, the reason behind that, I'll show you in the, the lab here, uh, was that uh, I'm using Docker Compose and the, the DNS to uh, actually load balance between three different uh, copies of the, the same service. And uh, the, the issue I ran into is keep alive because uh, I was doing the, the load balancing inside of Docker Compose via uh, just DNS round robining. Uh, the keep alive was sticking it to one of the, the three uh, servers instead of uh, rotating in between them, which causes a little bit of heartburn there. Uh, so yeah, otherwise, just to show you a little bit more of their documentation, their, their quick starts just really make life easy. Uh, this basically just walks you through a, how, how to do a Hello World uh, website for localhost. It just, no matter what you say, it responds back with Hello World. It just makes sense. But uh, the, the other spot where it's really quite helpful here is uh, inside the, this caddy file. Let's see, where, where was there? Uh, quick starts, I guess it was here. Uh, so you want to make like say a reverse proxy here. It walks you through all of the steps. So as a caddy file, you just write localhost, which will uh, basically proxy or reverse proxy your, your local host, only the URL for local host. You'd put like, say, if you had foo.com, it would be foo.com instead there. And then you just say reverse proxy and what port you want to uh, proxy. I, I guess to sort of loop backwards here, uh, just because uh, I, I realized I didn't do a great job of explaining what a uh, reverse proxy is. Uh, basically, if you remember right, uh, in uh, starting with a regular proxy, uh, you as a client uh, are on your network and you go through the proxy to uh, connect out to all the different websites you visit. And it will st usually store a copy on the server so that you don't have to necessarily go out over a slow line. And so like, say if you have 50 people in your office who all wanna to go to uh, Reddit or something like that, it's only downloading one copy of it so that you decrease the amount of bandwidth. It also, uh, for a net nanny sort of way, allows the people to either filter against uh, uh, oh, advertisement to get rid of advertisements or for your uh, uh, sysadmin to keep an eye on what sort of stuff you're uh, going out to and hopefully either prevent or figure out who just exfilled all the, the crown jewels and secrets of uh, the company. Well, a reverse proxy is the exact opposite of that. You have uh, one to many servers over here that aren't publicly accessible. You have a gateway and then all the clients connect through that gateway and can connect to one or many servers depending on what you're, you're wanting to do there, if that makes sense. And we'll... Uh, uh, the, the biggest gotcha that I ran into with Caddy is that uh, their documentation for how to do rewrites are a little bit uh, funny. So like say if you have a single page web app and then you want to have the, the API services that are running on a different uh, uh, server uh, in the same URL. So basically your API services be under the, the slash API. Uh, you have to uh, rewrite the, the service because uh, the, the API service doesn't actually know that it lives there. 
So, and we'll, we'll show you a little bit of what I mean here during the lab. They, their documentation was a little bit lacking in that I might actually send them a pull request to try and get that that better written up because they, they did a terrible job. They actually had their, their uh, version one of how to do it uh, written up and they've since changed it and completely refactored everything. So yeah, uh, welcome to open source. Uh, the second uh, thing I'm going to show you about is Nginx. It's the, the uh, short of Apache. It is the, the granddaddy of all the, the web servers just about. And uh, it is a, a kitchen sink of uh, different things that you can do with it. It can be a web server or reverse proxy like I talked about, a load balancer in both either HTTP or uh, like TCP and UDP uh, sockets. It can apparently proxy uh, both SMTP and uh, POP3 mail as well. Uh, it, I mean, it, it can do everything. And if it can't, uh, the uh, Nginx plus paid version of it uh, probably has the feature that you're looking for. It can even serve as like an authentication API gateway. Uh, a lot of that is a little more on their paid side, uh, but it, it basically is in charge of running the internet. Uh, based on the latest uh, Netcraft survey that I could find, it is still the winner. It's down a little bit in its rankings, but it's uh, responsible for hosting 33.4% of the internet. So you're in good company uh, using it. Uh, the, the next best one, if I remember right, was Apache. And then it just sort of gets weird uh, after that because it's a bunch of like, uh, uh, DNS parking and stuff like that. So, but it is also a lot harder than Caddy to actually configure. But you can do just about anything you want to do with it. And like I mentioned, if you're using it, you're in good company here. Um, just to call out a few of our favorite websites that use it uh, Starbucks, Bank of America, Amex, Cap One. I, I mean, some Italian telecom, et cetera, everybody's using it. And that's just the ones who are willing to admit it. And uh, I'll, I'll post these up here, but these are basically some of the, the documentation that I use to uh, work through how to make uh, the, the proxying and caching work. Uh, DigitalOcean has some great community uh, tutorials and the other one, Google was my friend. So just to dive into the demo here a little bit, uh, what am I demoing? Well, the, I, I have two different services that, that I'm going to be uh, caring about. The first is just a bog standard, uh, nothing special about it, uh, .NET Blazor uh, single page web app. And uh, here's my Docker file that I use to create it. It's just basically, uh, building the .NET uh, uh, WebAssembly single page web app as a release, running it as publish, and then just using, this will be a little weird because Nginx will be both my uh, uh, inside uh, server and then also the, for part of it here, my, my reverse proxy as well. And there'll be two different instances of it. So, uh, they, that's a little weird, but we, we can get through it. And oh, apparently my slides are out of the order. This makes a lot more sense. So I'm using Docker, Docker Compose like I hinted at. And the first one is just a uh, regular, I didn't do anything to change it, WASM uh, uh, .NET, .NET 5 uh, Blazor. So basically it, it's running .NET, but it's compiled, transpiled into JavaScript and uh, it's being hosted inside of Nginx Alpine. I have a Node.js that's just returning hello world and the name of the machine that it's running on. And then I have a demo in uh, Caddy as a proxy as well as uh, Nginx as the, the proxy. So like I hinted, this is just what's building my, my uh, standard uh, project here for .NET. And then uh, here's the uh, Nginx configure file. 
So uh, the, the big thing here is I'm adding this application WSAM uh, file, which is just a Java uh, script uh, slash WebAssembly file. I'm listening on port 80 and I'm just sharing anything that's in this folder to uh, slash. And if it doesn't exist, I return back the index.html that's getting the, the routing to work right on the, the single page web app because there's a bunch of uh, uh, pages that actually aren't really pages. They're just all in the same JavaScript. Uh, and then the router send, it makes it look like it's playing nice. So it a little bit of a hack there, but it works great. And uh, I'll, I'll actually pull it up here and show you in a minute here. But uh, as far as uh, the Docker command goes, if you just run it natively, uh, the I guess you can't see me pointing at my screen here. Uh, if you run Docker run uh, interactively. Yeah, we, we do see your pointer. Well, yes, you can see my pointer, but before I, I started moving the mouse, I was actually pointing at the screen. So that, that really didn't help much. Uh, so anyway, though, uh, so you're just running this and basically this is just what it looks like. It's the hello world, stupid, simple uh, app uh, for my uh, uh, Node.js. Again, this is just using Express, which is the, the simplest way to chuck a website on a page. And I'm getting the host name and I'm just saying hello world host name. Uh, built it using uh, npm init. And again, just a simple, stupid uh, uh, Docker file, and then running the, the hello world. Uh, and then it ends up be, being a uh, just random set of characters because it's running inside of Docker. So here are the, uh, the Docker compose file. What am I doing here? So we're, we're setting up uh, a, a set of those node machines and I'm asking for three of them. So I'll have three of them spun up, uh, all of them under the uh, DNS name nodes. I'm hosting the, the WSM and then there's the, the caddy proxy where I'm, and we'll just pull up and uh, actually edit the files here directly but I'm, explore, I, I'm uh, opening up uh, port 80 and port 40, uh, 43, which is the HTTPS. So if we actually pull up here and look, uh, let's see if I can't make this a little bit bigger for you guys here. So what's in our folder here? Uh, we have our caddy file in the Docker Compose. So our, our caddy file, again, we're just uh, listening to port 80 and we're running this, uh, uh, the, the uh, proxy pass through of nodes to 5,000. So if we run Docker Compose up, Here we can see we, we built up the files. And we apparently have an issue here. Wonder if when my machine rebooted, I ended up losing some stuff here. Uh, Apparently, I didn't uh, uh, sacrifice nearly enough to the uh, demo gods uh, uh, here. So, so here, let's. Let's see, that's a different project. Uh, so uh, editing on the fly here our uh, caddy file. So if we look back at uh, the, the PowerPoint project. Yeah, here we go. So a little bit of editing on the fly here. Uh, 
uh, that's a different. Sorry yeah, about that here. To do with listen. So. Yeah. Uh, so the the problem is here. Uh, it looks like I accidentally pasted uh, my uh, nginx uh, conf into my caddy file, and it got filed or got saved. So uh, unfortunately, since we have uh, peanut butter in our jelly, the, that's not going to play very nice. So we'll just uh, recreate it here. Uh, so again, what we're doing here is uh, the machine name is localhost. Uh, if we put a DNS name there, uh, it would actually go out and get the, the HTTPS uh, stuff. So route, uh, basically anything that's on slash and after that, or uh, on slash node will uh, get redirected to the, the node uh, proxy. And we rewrite everything to slash. And the reason why is uh, the node server is not expecting you to come at it with slash node. It's expecting you to come at it at slash instead. And so then we're going to say to reverse proxy and then nodes 3000, which is just the, the port that uh, nodes is uh, looking for. And the reason why we have to uh, turn off keep alive is to make sure that the load balancing works right. Since we have three of them, otherwise it gets pinned to the, the first one that we connect to and won't ever let go of it. So then the, the other uh, uh, service that we want to bring up is just the, uh, the uh, WebAssembly file. So reverse proxy, we want to connect to uh, whatever, which basically just ends up being everything but slash nodes. and. We want to connect to the DNS WSIM and port 80. Just that simple, fairly stupid easy. And if we go over here and then basically kill everything and restart it, then we'll actually get the, the right thing to work. And I don't care about it uh, stopping gracefully because it really doesn't matter. There, there's no state being saved. So if we bring it back up again, this time it should work. That looks a lot more promising. So now if we actually look at localhost, We get a warning that our uh, certificate is invalid, which is perfectly okay because if we take a look at it, it's localhost and this is a totally bogus certificate. We expect that, so we live on the wild side here. And as you can see, we loaded up the WSIM and the, the big thing to call out is that uh, Caddy by default redirected us from the HTTP to HTTPS. Uh, just on the fly automatically because really honestly in this day and age that's the right thing to do. And so now if we try just going to a, a bogus address here, as you can see it reloads the single page web app and it's actually redirecting us. It's doing the right thing. So if we go to node then instead you can see here we're, we're picking up uh, hello world and this is the machine name. And it's just that simple, it, it really is. So it, as you can see, it's uh, caddy is nice in the fact that it's fairly easy to use. It's uh, very approachable, but it also is not nearly as powerful as uh, uh, the Nginx is. So let's just go ahead and move on to nginx here and of course since i got impatient it got a little cranky with me but that's okay uh, so
And let's just make sure that my config file is right here. Okay, so that's looking promising here. Uh, th there are ways that you could shorten this up, but uh, apologies, this was about 3 a.m. when I was uh, getting this together last night. So uh, it was getting to be a little bit punchy there. Uh, so if we look, basically I'm recreating the exact same thing that I was doing in Caddy, just in Nginx. So uh, I have uh, one worker process and then it, the the events basically it's somewhat cargo calling here. If you were doing this in uh, earnest, you'd want to tune it to actually fit your uh, specific situation. But basically, we're listening on port eighty, and if you're on node, you want to uh, pass through to nodes in port three thousand, and then you're passing through some uh, headers so that the the end server can actually see who's calling it. Uh, we're turning off buffering just because we're straight up pass through. There, there are some uh, definite uh, speed ups that you could have or some uh, performance improvements here if you turn on and have your uh, reverse proxy do compression for you or various other stuff like that. Uh, we're pinning it to version 1.1 of uh, uh, the HTTP version, just because uh, I was having a little bit of trouble. Uh, Node really, really didn't like me last night when it was trying to pass through uh, HTTP version two. And uh, the one thing that I did find out here is uh, if you want to turn on re rewriting, so to change node to slash, uh, you just put that slash there. Uh, and if you don't have it, it will just pass through directly slash node uh, on. And uh, so th that little bit of documentation took a little bit of finding. So if you go node slash foo, it will actually go to node port 3000 slash foo instead of node slash foo, if that makes sense. And then the, the, the web assembly, it again just is some fairly simple stupid match slash and anything that comes after it um, if it isn't node again it's fairly stupid and simple for the, the little bit of nothing that we're doing here so if we run uh, docker compose up to build uh, build it up again And we wait for our service to come up. And as you can see, there's uh, uh, this time I only had uh, two uh, node servers um, that I, I built just because I wanted to show that you could vary that. And then one uh, Nginx uh, WSAM uh, service. So I'm going to open it in a different browser because the, the problem is uh, the way that Caddy handles the, the redirect, it actually uh, causes some minor issues because it kept keeps trying to redirect you back to HTTPS again because it gets marked as a permanent redirect. And since in Nginx, I didn't bother setting up HTTPS, uh, we, we definitely don't want to do that. So. If we go to localhost here, you can see we've got traffic and it works. And if we go to node, it works just as predicted. If we go to node foo, it can't get foo, which is okay because we, we know that it doesn't exist. And if we go to something else, you can see that the WSM single page app does the right thing as we'd expect. So jumping back here, basically it, it walks through uh, for the presentation, everything that we were, that I, I just showed you. Uh, any questions, thoughts, snide remarks? Um, how do you dynamically add or remove nodes? Say like you want to back them with like EC2 spot instances, they're going to go up and down. Uh, so one way that you can do that is by either uh, 
having clever DNS arrangements like how uh, Docker Compose is doing it, where there's standing, it's actually doing uh, the right thing, uh, round robining it. So uh, Docker Compose, you can actually do, uh, da I think it's uh, up dash nodes, and you, you can say how many instances you want for that. Or uh, as I was hinting at uh, in the, the uh, for the, uh, where is it here? Uh, sorry, it's a couple pages back in the, the Caddy tutorial. Uh, if you noticed, uh, it had various different ways of uh, actually setting that DNS. So uh, it was uh, oh, under reverse proxy. So if you use a service like, uh, oh, where was that documentation? If you use a service like console to actually uh, serve as the broker uh, where it registers and knows wh which uh, servers are uh, actually in the, the set. Uh, Zookeeper would be another one that you could use that basically keeps a state of what servers are up. Um, if you use uh, your things in Kubernetes uh, using Helm, uh, I believe Helm has some uh, DNS that would let you handle that. Yeah, because I, I, I'd only back it with like spot instances and lambdas and otherwise they just have like a little mini instance running and in, unless it's like load. Yep, and in this this case, uh, uh, since it's uh, the, the actual uh, handling of that's being done by Docker Compose, but uh, you, you can totally do that in inside of uh, Kubernetes just fine, I'm sure. I try to avoid Kubernetes. <laughs> I, I understand completely. And th that's where, uh, uh, oh, I think if you were using it in EC2, you, you'd probably really want to consider using uh, one of the, the EC2, or one of uh, Amazon's uh, tools for like API gateway or something like that where. Yeah, EC2 yeah, they have API EC2. gateway, which is what most people use for their Lambda functions. Um, and I, could, I, I was, yeah, you what's could probably, the resource usage? Uh, so, uh, the, the resource usage, uh, for, for caddy is, uh, and, well, for either Nginx or caddy, it's fairly, um, uh, light. Uh, I mean, really we're, we're not doing anything, but just taking something and passing it through where it can get a little painful is if you're doing the the https termination there and compression of course that both of those are going to hurt so it, it just depends yeah, well, on or if you're doing caching it's going to be ram bound yep uh but in the the case of uh, how we have the reverse proxy currently set up it's not doing any sort of uh, anything other than i take from here i give to there and it, it's not being uh, overly clever or trying to be overly um, cashy about things, if that makes sense. So it's a very light, I, I mean, the, this Docker Compose instance is just all running on, on my desktop here. And of course, now for your, your backing services, Node, Node is JavaScript, it's gonna hurt a little bit because it's Node. Uh, Nginx is fairly light. Its resources uh, can be as light as you want to configure it, basically. And uh, in my case, all of the, the images that I'm using are using Alpine. So e each Docker instance is very, very light, realistically. John, did you have a question there? Or? I was just uh, coughing. Oh, <laughs> but I, no, I was, no problem. I was wondering though, um, it occurred to me, I'm using, I'm trying to think what it's called, W's, US, UWS, something like that, I forgot. Does that work with Caddy as well? I mean, it's just, you know, um, port. I, 
I can't say I'm familiar with it. Uh, I think he's uh, trying to say WSL. No, no. Um, oh, it's a way of when you've got with PHP, you just have your PHP engine running, but sometimes you have other kinds of uh, CG fast CGI things. And there's another oh. system. I'm trying to think. It starts with a U. I'm trying to remember the name. I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, so. Uh, Let's see, modules here. Uh, so with Caddy, you've Is got... Is like Unicorn? U-W-S-G-I. Do, does that say anything to you? Right. Um, people use it for Py Python and um, some other... And Rails also. Oh, yeah. oh yes. U-W-S-G-I. Uh, okay. I, I, I know what you're talking about there. Uh, so what you could do is run like... Unicorn or something like that as the the uh, backing server, and then stand uh, Caddy in front of it as the the uh, reverse proxy, and just have it uh, proxy through. Like say for example, in my case, I, I'm using uh, 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 Node.js as one of them. So it's just uh, Node.js is uh, serving up the files, and Caddy's just doing the pass through and encryption basically. If that makes sense. Yeah. So if we we take a look at our, uh, let's see here, not, not that one I want. So if we we actually take a look at, and I open up the the right file here actually. Uh, so for our uh, node services. As you can see here, it's just a standard uh, uh, node uh, uh, web server just running uh, this app JS, which as I uh, indicated earlier, it's just a simple serve out hello world uh, service. So in your case, you could run your Python uh, web server or whatever uh, web server you want there, and it it will be just fine. And it, it you can have as many instances of that as you want, doing whatever heavy lifting you want to do there, if that makes sense, John. So, uh, yeah, that that was uh, the the prepared part of the the speech that I had uh, tonight here, uh, and uh, Chad, I know you'd mentioned uh, this uh, Sozu uh, uh, proxy. Oh, which, I, I haven't had a chance to play with it. Yeah, me neither have I, other than I got it to build, but. Uh, <laughs> So if people want to stick around, we, we can try playing with it. Uh, I was absolutely horrified by the lack of very good documentation they had. Uh, if we go to their, their website here, uh, actually, I think if I click on this one here, yeah, there it will come up. Uh, Oh, I see, I finally actually got all of the IRC messages that people were posting. Uh, oh, their website is terrible. Uh, is it HTTP only? It is. Wait, but it redirected. Redirect. redirect, it worked. Th that's really weird. Okay, well, here we are. Uh, so this is their, their website currently. Uh, Lots of promise, basically just tells you to run the, the cargo uh, and install it. And if you care about anything else, go to their GitHub page, which their, their biggest promise is that you can uh, configure on the fly without bringing it down. And uh, you can upgrade uh, basically hot swapping and uh, yeah, uh, otherwise they, they walk you through how to build it. 
and otherwise they're, they're really light on documentation unless you go into their docs and then they'll walk through how, how to uh, do some stuff, but it's, it's pretty rough. So we can uh, go ahead and uh, dive into it here, I guess, uh, unless someone else wants to uh, drive and uh, take a try at it. Uh, so if we kill here. I would assume and, there's some other like C or C++ micro frameworks out there that are a lot more mature. Yeah, I, I assume there are too. If anyone else wants to talk about their favorite proxy or reverse proxy or anything like that, feel free to chime in. Because I, I admit I, I've used them, but I, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert. If I remember both Google and Facebook uh, on their open source stuff, I like have one that they, 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 they host internally. I like their own, not Sozu. Yeah, so uh, to, to build it, basically all, all I have is just a uh, cargo uh, install and then you'd of course put the run here. So Docker And uh, part of the reason why uh, I'm building it, when I looked at the, the Docker Hub, it looked like the, the version that they had actually built and released out there uh, on Docker Hub was like uh, three or four years old at this point, which is horrifyingly old. Yeah, it could be. Some of them build off nightly, some of them barely upgrade. Yeah, uh, so the, these guys definitely haven't uh, updated or upgraded anytime soon. And unfortunately, it looks like uh, my uh, Docker instance lost its uh, copy of Rust. Uh, so we have to sit here and wait for a while for it to download because it's a monster of a uh, image. It looks and then like- you have this to download Cargo. Yes. So if uh, people want to talk about other stuff, uh, we, we can definitely while we're waiting here. I'm just trying to price up my head. Uh, like, like how much should I, I budget for RAM and CPU on, on a... So uh, the, the biggest answer on that really comes down to it, it depends on how much traffic you're going to get. Uh, for, for hosting my, my personal web blog, uh, a potato could probably uh, handle it. Uh, now, now, if you're uh, going to post something that uh, gets on the, the front page of uh, Reddit or something like that, you're, you're going to have a bad time. But uh, the, the good news is it, that's weird. Are you hosting on a potato? I'm just... <laughs> uh, apparently, uh, the, this is just running Docker desktop here and uh, the, uh, apparently it failed to compile dependencies. Artifacts. Dependencies? What's to blow away your cargo.lock file? The, the thing is, there, there is no uh, cargo.lock. It, it, uh, you know what? Let, let's just. Yeah, that, that rust is kind of out of date. You might want to pull a nightly container. Actually, let's go uh, Docker run instead. Let's just go on the fly here. Run. Nightly and let's run bash inside there. Oh. Uh, 
let's see, what would be a valid uh, name for uh, the, the rust here? Uh, let's quick take a look here at the, the Docker Hub and Uh, see uh, what is the, the latest uh, nightly for it. Uh, so looking here. I just installed this. Um, Let me just run a Rust version. Okay, what, what version would you recommend? I'm seeing 149 looks to be Yeah, I'm on 149. Okay, well, let's try 1.49 here. Uh Okay, so then uh, if so, and then their uh, instructions for building it were uh, da, 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 so, so. cargo install Sozu. So if we right click here, we'll see what we can get. So this is a point where I solicit from the, the crowd, uh, anyone interested in uh, uh, demoing something uh, for uh, next month? Or what do you want to hear about? Machine learning, maybe? Sure. I have an M1. So we could have a little Compiling show uh, Chad's, uploading Chad into his M1 machine. Actually, if we got Brad Dwyer on, he'd probably be the best. Uh, could you try that one more time, Chad? You you kind of glitched. Oh, out. I I said if we could invite Brad Dwyer to to run us through some ML Unixy stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you do you want to uh, make the the invite and intro there, or? I don't have a special one with Brad. He's usually pretty busy. I tried to get him interested in with today's meeting, but I did I didn't give much more warning, so he probably ignored it. Oh, he's probably doing family stuff at this hour. Uh, we we can definitely make a uh, dive into uh, machine learning uh, sort of things. I I admit uh, I I would be even more of a uh, noob at uh, presenting on it than uh, I am at this. So, if someone uh, else is more knowledgeable, by all means. Google Colab notebooks are very nice, and they even give you like uh, free GPU access. All you need is a, a Google account. Yeah, I, I've used them before. They're they're really quite nice. Uh, Chad, you seem to be a little more plugged into the machine learning space. Would you have uh, time to say something? Uh, I, I, I for a while I've been wanting to play with my M1 because it has all that nice uh, specialized hardware. I just haven't uh, actually fired up Apple's ML tools yet. Yeah, the, the most I've done machine learning wise uh, so far has been uh, a couple of years ago, I, I played around with a getting a facial recognition to work on a, a Raspberry Pi uh, to sort of serve as a, uh, a replacement for a ring doorbell sort of style thing with a webcam. And yeah, it, there's, it, there's actually some, some fun stuff you can do with Snapchat style filters. Oh, that, that would be very cool. Okay, fun. so just uh, to make a, kind of like a Linux based or C Rust based uh, like Snapchat zoom filter that you could intercept your camera driver with. 
that, that would be neat. Uh, so Chad, can I pencil you down then for uh, next month or? Sure, I want to learn how. Awesome. Well, I, I'm interested in learning uh, vicariously through you then. I actually, my, my, my kind of project for the, this next month is uh, I have a project uh, kind of like Rails, except it's for uh, spinning up uh, cloud infrastructure for teams. Very interesting here. I'll I'll go ahead and hit uh, stop record since we we've sort of wandered into the uh, uh, lug after dark uh, hours here, and th that way we 